Thank you, Shaki. Excellent. And there's some great stuff in there, some great initiatives and, uh, and funding. So please see uh, Shaki and E2I, uh, one of our gold sponsors out there in the, in the foyer. Uh, after we finish, they'll still be hanging around. So thank you. So that concludes our presentations for Logisim. Now we're going to work into a, a showcase event. And you won't hear from me. So I'm going to hand over to Stephanie Krishnan, who will introduce the Skunk Works innovation in the supply chain industry. Thanks, Steph. All right, I'm not going to take the stage because this is not about me. Um, for those that are interested in the Skunk Works, uh, the Skunk Works is, is something that we've been doing for a few years now, and it's basically an opportunity for uh, new startups to actually showcase what they do. Um, you know, we do have a lot of change in many industries and we've seen some great change that's been happening. However, the adoption of new technology can be sometimes slow in our industry. We can be sometimes what, resistant to change. We argue that the reason that we're resistant to change is because we've got too much work to do. We're focused on the delivery of orders, we're doing everybody else's work, you know, we're logisticians. Um, but the industry is moving ahead, and we do need to keep on top of that. So what we are doing as part of the Skunk Works is to showcase young, innovative firms, like the startups that we'll be having today, that are actually making business cases for the way to move forward. They're taking new ways of, of managing information, new ways of looking at the world, and turning them into business cases. So today we actually have a number of startups who are, present, who are aiming to present their value to you. Now, as you view these startups, I'd like you to think, how are they relevant to your organization? What role do they play in our supply chain? And with this one, our startups are focused on sustainability in line with the theme of our, our show, our, our uh, event this year. So we've got three wonderful sustainability startups that are actually going to be looking at areas that focus on sustainability in the supply chain. We will have Marina Chain, Green Cop, and Zuma, Zuma Carbon. Right? And these three organizations will be uh, following a format. So the session, that the, the way that this will run is that each will give, have about you know, eight to 10 minutes to present. They'll go through their offerings, um, talk to us about you know, where they found the gap in the, the market and, and where they see the opportunity and, and what their offering is. Right? After that, um, each of them, so I'll be uh, hosting uh, Rena Chain, I'll have Roger Chu, our, our friend Roger here, who will be uh, hosting Green Cop, and we'll have Lawrence, who's also the business director of uh, uh, SC Fulfill, uh, SO Fulfill, who will be um, helping us look at the, uh, uh, looking after Zuma Carbon, right? Sorry, Roger has Zuma Carbon, you have Green Cop, sorry. <laughs> So what we'll do is we'll uh, ask a few questions, make a little bit of a summary, and then we're going to open it to you to ask them questions and to think about how they will fit in with your supply chains. All right. So it's a little bit of interaction here. It is a bit of a showcase. Uh, and with that, I'd like to get started by inviting Marine Chain to the floor to present. The stage is yours. All right. Listen, take notes, and ask questions. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction, Stephanie. You know, shipping could learn a thing or two about the energy level you bring to conferences. And you know, starting first uh, to represent Skangwo is always a very high. It's either very auspicious or very inauspicious. <laughs> but anyway, I'd like to thank you know Kendrick, uh, Lawrence, and the larger Logisim team, Logisim team for inviting a young startup over. So, all right. I think let's begin. So, uh, next slide. So a little bit about myself. I'm from Marina Chain. I'm Sean Liu. I am Chief Product Officer at a Marina Chain, so I run Product, Carbon, and Strategy. And it's nice to be back uh, in the logistics side of things because I spent a year in the US uh, with a battery company, uh, actually in cold chain, so we're providing uh, flexible batteries uh, for cold chain. So it's nice to be back to see what's new in the industry. And for better or for worse, I swam into maritime. Yeah. So I think next slide. So a Marina Chain, we are a Singapore-based uh, green tech startup. Uh, focusing on the shipping industry. So we work a lot with ship owners and, you know, uh, to work uh, and accelerate on maritime decarbonization. So we provide a carbon accounting service uh, and a vessel emission management software. And so some, some little factoids about our company is that uh, we're actually half Korean. 
and you're looking at the, the younger side of the company where you know, we run, the Singaporeans run the tech side of things and the strategy side. Uh, but we're, we're helmed with our other two co-founders who have over 20 years uh, in, in the shipbroking and the shipping industry. So some little fact, more, more information is that you know, about 200 ships are signed to date. We are about a year old. Uh, it's very fun, nice to always see PSA or like a, you know, familiar maritime faces because we were part of PS71, which is the MPA's accelerator for, for maritime startups. Uh, and those of us in the carbon might be interested to know that we also partnered uh, with South Pole and CIX. So we also deal very heavily with carbon credits and trying to uh, make carbon projects. And I think so today, uh, we're not selling you software, right? Because again, as you notice, I am maritime native and this is a logistics uh, symposium. So it's, uh, our objective here today is really to learn more about how we can help you guys and how we share data. And I think the opportunity uh, and you know, the synergy we see here is actually in scope three, which I'll cover later. So I think first we'll just share a little bit of what we do so you get an idea of what we do as a, as a company, uh, our strengths uh, in digitization and for our maritime clients. And again, let's talk about scope three, which I, I think is a wonderful area of opportunity. And so I think every one of us here is familiar, uh, but for us in the maritime industry and, and as a company, we're very familiar with dealing at all levels of reporting and regulation. So obviously at the highest level, we, every country or company or organization has to decarbonize. So that's at the Paris level. Uh, in, in the maritime industry, we have our own actually a compliance regulation to comply with. That's the IMO CII regulation or carbon intensity. And obviously uh, the, the biggest uh, news in town is EU's ETS, which is now starting to tax uh, the maritime industry. So we're, we're used to helping our clients again at all levels and even at the uh, international uh, voluntary frameworks level. And so we work a lot with the operations teams, uh, the sustainability teams and your risk teams. And you know, we like to say again, regulations are here and you know, they, are, they should be factored as part of a business as usual uh, scenario. And so just sharing a little bit more about uh, in the maritime space, uh, there's really a misalignment between the IMO level and the Paris agreements. Hopefully logistics does not have the same issue. And what, what we tend to notice and what we're really good at doing is actually dealing with life cycle analysis. And one of your key disjoints uh, that we're helping a lot of our clients with is that on one hand, the IMO's regulation are actually really based on a tank to wake basis. Whereas you know, when you look at a Paris Agreement or even on uh, the financial side of uh, green financing, they're generally looking at a well to wake basis or life cycle analysis. And so that ties in, I think, very perfectly to scope three and where we see uh, the, the opportunity. And so uh, how, how do we digi digitize uh, maritime uh, data for maritime clients? So uh, it was very heartening to, to see that whether it's logistics or, or shipping, digital does not mean digital. <laughs> so just sharing that, you know, throughout our one year, we got really good at dealing with disparate, uh, unconnected data sources. And so from our experience, uh, what we learn when our clients tell us that we have a digital solution is that they really mean Excel sheets. Uh, some of our clients even still work with emails. Uh, and so that just makes you know, setting targets or trying to understand real-time carbon emissions a pain. You know, data analysis is not even at the forefront of their minds. And you know, generally, we work with small to medium-sized clients. And, and obviously, the last part is that when you deal with physical logbooks, human errors. So throughout our one year, we de developed a lot of competencies you know, through our OCR algorithms or just our machine learning algorithms that were able to spot some of these human errors. And so, yeah, maritime. And so just showing a little bit about uh, the software. So we are a web platform uh, where we help our shipping companies, again, like aggregate all these uh, data streams into one common platform, you know, help them visualize the data, help them set uh, the targets. And again, everything starts from you know, the operational data, what we call noon reports. And so if you're a manager, you can easily see your carbon footprint. And we layer that with our carbon accounting uh, uh, analysis, right? So whether it's well to wake or tank to wake, uh, things like uh, the emission factors that you're using for different fuel types and whether or not you're calculating CO2 on a 20-year basis or a 100-year basis. Uh, these are stuff that uh, we had to uh, learn along the way and we got really good in. And then so finally for the logistics people in the, in the room here today, uh, what, what is of very big interest for us is really trying to better capture uh, the data and the granularity of reporting for the value chain, which involves both the maritime side and the logistics side. And so, you know, we see a very strong need uh, in scope three uh, reporting. Uh, number one, the SEC is already starting, uh, the US SEC has already started to mandate scope three disclosures. And so some of you, whether you're working with your, your cargo owners, they may start to be asking for scope three disclosures or some form of uh, carbon uh, certifying uh, report of your business. And naturally, I think the synergy we see here in logistics, and we're very thankful for this opportunity, is that we have the maritime upstream data and whether it's you're on the 3PL side or you're the freight forwarder side, you have data from your operations. 
And these two naturally together would form scope three. And so that's uh, an interesting area to, to work together with uh, the, the people here today. And I think very naturally, you know, as you saw from Marina Net, what we do very great on the maritime side, we naturally ported it over to a uh, very basic uh, carbon accounting software. And you know, the typical benefits of you know, carbon accounting software is having a single source of truth. You, know, you get to collaborate on the same data stream. You get to do your data analysis and collecting and just visualizing uh, your, your data. Uh, but again, uh, I would say we are not really a carbon accounting software, but rather we view ourselves as consultants enabled uh, by software. Uh, as you guys uh, in the audience might already know, you're already probably dealing with three to four different kinds of software. And the last thing you want is another software to visualize carbon emissions. And, and that's what we also notice from maritime clients. And so that is why we're focusing a lot more of our energy as being a service provider to help them do carbon accounting. And we noticed that you know, very few software can really capture uh, the boundaries of uh, your business correctly. And you know, earlier when PSA was sharing about uh, scope one, scope two, or scope three emissions, these are concepts that are easy to grasp, but getting the boundaries right and getting it verifiable and getting it done with the right methodology, that is not as easy as it seems. And we just noticed that software doesn't really capture that process correctly. Uh, number two is that, as I was sharing earlier, we, we noticed a lot of software out there are trying to use averages from the industry. But again, when the world is moving towards more accurate and granular reporting, the, it just, the need just isn't there. And so that's why for us, we're happy to share that you know, maritime data uh, as the single source of truth, which is the most accurate you're ever going to get. Uh, and then lastly, if, if you're a logistics company who's looking for a simple carbon platform, we can always warehouse the data uh, on, on our systems. And I think so, so last part, that brings us to the end, a very simple presentation. And so today, you know, our objective is to really learn from the logistics player here, whether you're 3PL or freight forwarding, how you're dealing with scope three and you know, what kind of data are you guys looking at. And as I earlier shared, we're more than happy to share the maritime data and to be that intermediary, whether you're working with a, a maritime company, uh, can you understand the, the carbon data they're sending it to you? So we would love to be the intermediary to make sense of all that maritime nuances and terminologies and just turning it into a simple CO2 and compiling that as your scope three uh, reporting. And then if you are in need of carbon accounting services or software, we're happy to provide that uh, as well. And so thank you. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Exactly, yeah, and then we transform it to life cycle uh, analysis as well. Okay, all right. So, uh, what sort of shipping lines are you working with? Who are the companies? Yeah. You know yeah, yeah. So, so, the fun fact about us is that, you know, Singapore sadly doesn't have a lot of the big shipping companies. So, a lot of our clients are actually from Korea. Yeah, and so they're generally like small to medium sized shipping companies, about 10 vessels to 5 vessels. So that's the range we're looking at. Okay, yeah. so, um, and then as I noticed on their website, they actually have a benchmark. Oh. And they say yeah. uh, what sort of data they're collecting for each of those shipping lines, which is it's quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a dash, I suppose. What is that? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's one fun thing when we, again, talk about carbon accounting, right? Again, we're all familiar with the word accounting. And again, we're all familiar with the word scope one to three. But there is actually a very standardized way and specific way that you are supposed to calculate this disclosure. And PSA earlier shared uh, the word that you're looking for is the called GHG protocol. And what we noticed, Stephanie, is that there were actually some companies who were reporting scope one emissions, but it was not compiled to the GHG uh, protocol standard. And so if, if you're working with any companies like this or, and really boils down to the reports, can you really trust uh, the reports? And I think the larger part of carbon reporting is really about making sure you can verify this data, you can trust uh, this data. So that's what the dashes mean. Okay. That, yeah. Maybe not sure you can trust that bit. Yeah. <laughs> All right, does it capture all the ships of those companies? So if they've got like five ships, 10 ships, it captures 100% of their fleet? Yeah, so, so, so the funny thing about digital, right, is that ideally they are using our reporting system. So we, we really turned all your paper reports into something that someone can fill in online. Uh, but we also know that uh, some companies are resistant to change as you're sharing. And so they're like, hey, I still want to send my emails. Right? So we built the ability to receive that email and download the Excel file and extract uh, data. So we made it as seamless as it is to just capture this data based on your current workflows. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, my last question is, is it limited to CO2 emissions? Ooh, great question. I think for now we, we see more, more need uh, in CO2. 
Uh, the, the good thing about the maritime industry is that for knocks and socks, right, so uh, they are already controlled at the IMO level. And so the, the regulators, or what you call the class societies, are already uh, keeping that under control. And again, the, the major drivers of knocks and socks come from the fuels. So the fuel, at the fuel level, it's already too compliant. So it's a great question, but for now we're just focusing on CO2 because that's the, the one that, especially on a life cycle basis, the numbers can be drastically different. Yeah. yeah. My fellow hosts, any questions? Yeah, so, so again, what we learn, and I'm not sure, we would love to learn more about the specific considerations shipping has, uh, but the last thing we want is to have another software in addition to your software. So as I was sharing earlier, we just love to share the, the maritime side of the data as an API. We are a software company, and we're re I think we're really good at dealing with data. We're already integrating with a few of the class uh, in the maritime, the regulators, right? So when a ship owner uses our system, the data is immediately sent to the class societies. So again, like APIs are sim simple to ask, and I think that's what we envision moving forward, where there, if there is a centralized like 3PL system, we're happy to just take that maritime data and just turn it into a CO2 number for you. Yeah, just a follow-up question probably. So um, I like your you know, statement earlier to say that you know, you're not a software company, you're a consultant, yeah. well done, and then also with the APIs and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think there's, a, there's another statement that you make, and I think I'm not too sure whether the rest of the team here may, may resonate, mm -hmm. is that do we really understand the report? Yep. Sometimes you send a report, it's like, yes. okay, what do I, how do I make sense of it? Yep. So I'm, I'm just going to ask the question, maybe to learn from you also, is that with these reports, mm -hmm. um, how do we make sense of it? And on the assumption to say that, okay, we come to some common understanding whatsoever, you call it. Yep. What would be the next step? What, what improvement plan can, let's mm. say, me as a shipper make, or yep. how can I make my, let's say, a 3PL, you know, what can they do yep. you know, to improve moving forward? Mm. Well, that's a, that's a million dollar question. <laughs> so I think the first part, I'll maybe share a little bit about, if you're from the logistics side, what are the terms you should be looking for? Then maybe I'll answer your question on how, how do you set targets? So as I earlier shared, if, if any of your supply chain people give you a scope one to three number, the next question you ask is, how was it calculated? What is the methodology? And I think Stephanie was earlier sharing, if you go to our website, you see that we compiled a very, we actually mined through every shipping company's sustainability report and we extracted that information. So you're looking for words like it was compiled according to the GHG protocol or the ISO equivalent of it, ISO 4064, I believe, yeah, or 83, one of it. 64, yeah. So if you see that, you can trust that standardized and you can actually compare. Right? If they are unable to answer how they calculated that scope one or two emission for you, that should be your first red flag. Because the number really doesn't hold water, at least when you're trying to compare it you know, between different providers. Right? So, so, and the second thing I'll look at is that if you're now looking at CO2 as a number, uh, I will encourage, and, and I think the trend of the industry is that we're looking at what we call GWP20. So I think in simple English, you know, let's say you have five different chemicals. They're all greenhouse gases. Everything is standardized to CO2. And when you standardize it to CO2, the warming potential is calculated on a 20-year or a 100-year basis. And obviously, the number you want is a 20-year basis. So the 100-year basis is obviously a smaller number because the, the CO2 has had time to release its you know, warming potential slowly. But the 20-year horizon is what you want because all our net zero targets are 2050. So that's another way that some of your supply chain might try to shave off 10% or 20% of their emissions. So that's information. Now, target setting, okay? So target setting is uh, tough. I think we're, we're only at the ability where we can tell you whether you can compare the numbers and we give you the granularity to know where your emissions are from. Uh, but I think the industry knows uh, of the, the same common ways that you have to reduce your emissions, move over to alternative fuel sources, biofuels, which are still the major driver of uh, emissions. And then simple things on scope two would be you know, energy saving of your lights. And as I say, you, you can't reduce something you don't track. And so we are here at more at the information level, trying to give you the right information. Yeah. And I think the, the point there is also yeah. that you know, 
Many organizations are at the point where they're pulling all this information in manually, and if it's in one area, that they can pull it all in together and have that number yep, yep. without having to calculate using, you know, 15 sheets of Excel, et cetera, et cetera. That's yep, already yep. a win, right? Um, if I ask you a question on it. No? Oh, one on the board. Okay. Uh, I am a shipper. How do I work with you to manage scope three emissions? It's more about getting the number for the. Yep. Yeah, wonderful. So, I mean, if you're a shipper, you know, based on your vessels, you can easily use the Marina Net platform. Or you can just send us, you know, in shipping, at the end of the year, you have to give your IMO DCS to class. Right? So, you can send, send us that data, and then we'll ask you follow-up questions like, what was your fuel type? You know, and then because for different fuel types, there are different emission factors. And we just turn it into an easy report in CO2 for you to understand your impact. Okay, and I think we've got time for one more. What's your revenue model? When do you expect to be profitable? Ooh, wonderful question. So, so for Marina, and again, I think I was sharing earlier, we are, we're not logistics native, we're maritime native. So on the maritime side, we, uh, number one, we have a subscription service to our emissions management platform, but we're also doing a carbon accounting services uh, for our Korean clients. And so, so consulting, and if you're interested in using a software where it's beneficial, that's software, uh, for logistics, I, I think we're very open to just have a warm discussion and again, making sense of your maritime data that your uh, maritime or shippers are giving you and just helping you turn it and integrating that, yeah. But you want a number, uh, so for the shipping vessel emissions, we are charging about 200 US uh, a month, yeah. Uh, but for logistics or just carbon accounting, uh, it's actually way more expensive. So we understand from the industry is that carbon accounting software ranges annually from about 6,000 US to maybe even a few hundred thousand US based on the size of your company. And so I think as a startup, uh, we, we tend to just guide on the lower range and just understand what we're getting ourselves into. But yeah, for those of you who want numbers, those are your numbers. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Any last minute questions from the audience? Going once, going twice. Thank you, pleasure. Yeah, so happy to chat and know more about how we can help. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. So the uh, next presenter uh, that will be sharing with us um, is uh, Hansen. Hansen is the uh, CEO and uh, co-founder of Green Corp and they have been uh, very focused in terms of sustainable energy as well as environmental solution and they have been um, you know reading from the <coughs> presentation and the materials they are actually developing and commercializing some of the uh, sustainable 2G which is second generation biofuel as a transition fuel to the conventional hovercraft in order to cut emission. So, um, Hansen, Hansen is actually, um, he pursued a uh, PhD in chemical and biomolecular engineering in NUS, all right, and uh, he's actually a co-founder and CEO of uh, Green Corp Private Limited, um, where he established himself also as a thought leader as well as innovator in the uh, green tech space. So, without further ado, Hansen. Thank you for the introduction and hello everyone. My name is Hanson. I'm the CEO and co-founder for Green Corp. So uh, without further time, let's continue with proceed. So let's begin by understanding the magnitude of carbon emission challenge that we face today. So as you all know, global carbon emission actually leads to climate change. Within the broader context, the transport logistic sector actually plays a significant role to contribute to the carbon footprint. So according to the IEA, actually they account for more than one-fifth of the carbon emission in global perspective. So the alarming figure calls actually calls up immediate action to mitigate the environmental challenge in the supply logistic industry. So now let's address a misconception that people believe that sustainable solutions in supply chain are inherently expensive. Contrary to the popular belief, we actually think that sustainability does not equate to high cost. In fact, integrating sustainability solution can cause a long-term cost-saving processes. Now, for example, tax in Singapore context, the initial carbon tax rates are set as $5 per tonne of carbon dioxide generated equivalent and increases to $25 in 2025, $45 to 2026, and continue to increase to between $50 to $80 by 2030. So you can see the impact of the cost saving in terms of carbon tax if we integrate 
the sustainability solution. So what are the solutions that can significantly reduce the carbon emission immediately in the transport sector is the use of biofuel. So biofuel not only offer renewable alternatives, they also can be compatible to the existing transportation infrastructure. So while biofuel is already there for some years, so the advancement of development already leads to second generation biofuel where it can overcome the limitation for the first generation biofuel. So let's go into the context. What is first generation biofuel? So first generation biofuel actually primarily de derived from the edible crops like corns, sugarcane, etc. However, we know that it could reduce the carbon emission, but it compete with the food production processes, where it leads to rise in food price and also food security problem. Other than that, you need land to grow these energy crops. So they might use deforestation, which might mitigate, or I would say, sorry, it will offset the environmental impact. So on the other hand, second generation biofuel could overcome the limitation of first generation biofuel because the utilization of the non-edible bio-waste. So here refers to garden waste, agricultural waste, forest waste, and more and more. So this could cause a minimization of overall environmental impact and also does not cause a food security problems. So at Green Corp, we actually committed to drive sustainability in the supply chain industry. Through extensive R&D, we actually developed an innovative solution to produce second generation biofuel. So we own the technology to produce biofuel in a more cost-effective process. So we actually focus this waste stream of plant waste, for example, agricultural residual, forest residual, and garden waste, so that it could contribute to the circular economy approach. Now you might think that we use cooking oil is the main feedstock in the second generation biofuel production, like Neste and etc. So we have focused in plant-based waste instead. So there's a few reasons that we come to this decision. First, use cooking oil can be limited and inconsistent. So it makes it very challenging to secure a reliable and sustainable feedstock. Secondly, biofuel specifically fame, which is produced from used cooking oil can point to degradation over six months time. So by prioritizing these plant-based waste, we ensure a more reliable, sustainable feedstock resources with our commitment to environmental stewardship. So as technology and process continue to evolve, the scalability of the efficiency of this sustainable biofuel from plant-based waste are improving. So our continuing effort to optimize these processes to ensure it's cost-effective and viable for large-scale implementation. So we are committed to stay at the forefront to drive the advancement of the sustainable biofuel production. So a little background that our company is, we actually started our journey as an NUS PhD research project back in 2018. So after that, we also joined the NUS group to commercialize the technology. And along the way, we were selected in Shell Startup Engine and also Pier 71, which is closely worked with MPA, and we ended up the first runner up. Just two months back, we actually been invited to a paid pilot project in Shanghai to test our to in, to in test our technology in the actual commercial plant. This also actually learned that in actual context in Singapore, we do not have such plant to look into it. So we learned a lot through that. Recently in Singapore Marine Time Week, we signed an MOU to join the Sus Coastal Sustainability Alliance. So this CSA actually we aims to build a next generation ecosystem to decarbonize, electrify, and transform the Singapore maritime industry towards a circular economy approach. So where the Corp focus is, we actually wanted to produce this second generation sustainable biofuel towards the PXO vessel and platform series like Lactar Tark, uh, Habercraft, and etc. So sustainability in the supply chain industry cannot be achieved by one company alone, which sounds back to what just Mr. Wolfgang shared just now. Collaboration is the key to drive these meaningful changes. We firmly believe that fostering partnership from suppliers, partners, and other stakeholders could create a better future. 
By collaborating, we can share knowledge, resources, best practices, and this could accelerate the adoption of sustainability solutions in the industry. So together, we can make a significant impact in this industry, and we can create a more sustainable future. Thank you very much. I'm from Green Cup Hansen. All right, thanks, thanks, Susan. Um, maybe I just open to the floor. Um, anybody has got some burning questions? Yes, please. I've got one over there. Okay. I can do below. Right? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi, thanks Hi. for the presentation. Wonderful presentation. Uh, does your technology allow decentralized production at the source or need transportation of waste to another central site? Okay, so our current technology, we are planning to build near to the source because of the logistic cost. So thinking of if we're building a full-scale plant in Singapore, we have not enough fit stock here, for example. So we might need to build the source, the, the plants near to the sources, which is in a suitable scale, so that we do not need to import the waste into Singapore. That's also a cost logistic issue, and also cannot be clarifiable that we need to import waste into Singapore. That's the, the reason that we need to build a plant near to the source, so that not only can secure a sustainable feedstock, the other one we also can get a sustainable fuel production. Hope that's answered your question, thank you. Yeah. Great, thanks. Yes, please. Yeah, it's really great what you're doing. Um, I had a question about um, the biofuels and what kind of regulatory um, support you would need to get biofuels for use in commercial, um, you know, ocean liners. Because, you know, you, you want to be able to get this accredited and through the system so it can be used. Um, where are you in that journey at the moment? Okay. Uh, well, that's a critical question that uh, currently we are having a hard time because we are now working closely with uh, M GCMD, MESD, those government regulatory. And we understand that in maritime industry, there's only one standard they are referring, which is ISO 8217. So for this 8217, actually, it's not too comprehensive. So it actually covered towards biodiesel, but not the alternative fuel that government rolling out, like methanol, ammonia, hydrogen. So now we're actually working closely that how do we retrofit this fuel, fits to ISO 8217, also work closely with them that whether this fuel have potential to cover in the revised version coming out in 2024. So this is the journey that we are doing now, and we hope it can retrofit more types of vehicles and small standards can be done. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, sure. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh I think what you're trying to do is a good presentation. I like it. I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to replace uh, pit stock uh, with uh, waste. Right? That's uh, what you're trying to do. But how would you try to regulate the inputs that come in? Because pit stock, you can regulate the inputs that are coming in. Waste, uh, you cannot regulate what is coming in. How do you manage uh, the input flow? Okay, uh, that's also another question that's really critical that the input where we work closely with the aggregator, there's a role, position role that we call it the waste aggregator that every day they will collect all kinds of waste throughout Singapore, throughout the countries. So in Singapore context, they actually collected and they sent to TWAS, which is a WTE plant for the incineration processes. So now currently we are collecting all kinds of waste. So for the Plant-based waste, we will put into our processes. For the non-plant-based waste, they will be solved by other ways, for example, WTE or other technology. But we understand that in other countries, for example, India, there's uh, some company, they're already doing the aggregate side. They aggregate nicely, clean it, size down, and sell the waste like $5 per ton. So there's a business model for aggregation side. Then we have to work it closely to ensure that the fuel product, sorry, the fuel produced are up to the quality. Yeah, thank you. Okay, that's thanks very much. So maybe we just take one last question uh, in view of time. So I guess this question is very similar to what Sean had to answer just now. Yeah. So the question, is, uh, Hanson, what is your revenue model and how do you expect? Oh, sorry, when do you expect to be profitable? I think the revenue model will be uh, very direct because uh, we actually go through secure sustainable feedstock supply, 
to your produce and sell it to end user. So similarly, it will be the user will go to the station and get, for example, three dollar per liter gasoline and etc. Then from there, we hope to profitable uh, after we can build up the plant. So that we are going efforts in constructing the plant. Hope to get this two year time. Yeah, that's what our effort done. Thank you. Okay, great. So, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Mr. Hansen, please. Thank you. Okay, so. Our next presenter is the Harry Nayib. Harry is the CEO and co-founder of Zero Common, a big tech startup that provides enterprise solutions to measure, report, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Harry holds a degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Michigan and other, and was has worked closely with environmental and security regulations, reporting, and strategy. Indeed, the zonal carbon team that built and commercialized the Meridis and PMS API carbon management platforms. Zonal carbon is the second venture as an entrepreneur after having founded and successfully edited and Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the kind intro. And uh, thanks for the Logisim team for inviting me here today. So, oops. So my name is Harry. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of Zuno Carbon. So I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about how we as a company help to take the toil or all the effort associated with it out of sustainability. So I know there were a lot of speakers before me, and I'm probably standing between you and happy hour right now. So I'll try to keep this as entertaining as possible. So as Sean said before me, as well as Stephanie and a lot of people mentioned, sustainability isn't easy. There's a lot of work that goes into it, and there's a lot of toil. There's a lot of departments that have to work together. And the data itself is so federated and it's so spread apart that how do you really know the data is accurate? How do you really know that things are being done correctly? So before we talk more about Zuno, I'd like to talk about healthcare. I know this is a logistics symposium, but bear with me. So let's say you don't feel too good. You decide to go to the doctor, and you're like, hey, I don't feel well. What's wrong with me? But instead of doing any blood work or anything, they ask you about your expenditure habits, how much money you spend on food, alcohol, gym membership, so on and so forth. And using just that financial data, within like a minute or two, they pump out a report saying, all right, looks like you have high cholesterol, you have a fatty liver, but your, your, cholesterol, your blood sugar looks OK. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be too comfortable walking away from that appointment. But what they do in real life is they go ahead, send you for some blood work. They ask you about your day-to-day -day activity. Are you sedentary? What do you do? And then using that data, they come up with a tailored plan, medication on how you can reduce uh, your health risk, improve your lifestyle. So why is it that when it comes to the planet's health, we do things so differently? And unfortunately, this is what we see a lot right now with carbon accounting startups, carbon accounting companies, and so on, where they're just relying heavily on non-primary data sources like financial accounting data. And the issue with this is there's a huge limitation because if you're just looking at your expenses, you don't really know where that, those emissions are coming from, not just within your supply chain, but also from your own operations. And when you have limited visibility into your data, then you have a limited opportunity to use this data to optimize your operations. So you're, you're, instead of actually doing something with it, you're just stopping at reporting and essentially just killing more trees rather than doing anything regarding sustainability. And because financial data usually has to be audited before you can use it, a lot of times the responses are reactive. So you see a lot of offsetting, you know, a lot of uh, trees planted that get grazed by sheep and so on and so forth. Whereas if they're able to track it in real time, then there's a bit more of an opportunity for them to optimize this in a more agile way. So just looking at the cost and toil, right? So professional services, I came from the consulting company. I know how much it costs to put people out there to crunch spreadsheets. So professional services, sensors, equipment, everything alone can cost a ton in terms of uh, the resources just per year to pump out a report. And on top of that, companies spend a lot of time as well to put this together. So all this cost, all this effort, all this time spent on doing carbon accounting leaves very little room for actual tangible actions. And we heard today a lot about the aggressive targets a lot of companies have set. And even looking at governments, right, there's been a lot of good targets, a lot of good initiatives. But how do we get there if we're just doing reporting? So that's where we at Zuno Carbon come in. So we've built an end-to-end, -end, not just carbon accounting, but an ESG management platform. So what we do at the core of it is automate data collection, calculation, and reporting. And by taking away the bulk of the grunt work, then we're allowing 
you to unlock latent insights into your operations, into your supply chain, into your vendors, and create a sustainability roadmap. And based on that, you're able to accelerate your journey to net zero or whatever your targets are, because you're essentially freeing up your sustainability team, your sustainability consultants, and so on and so forth. So how do we do this? Well, financial accounting data is just the tip of the iceberg. Right? Beyond that, there's a lot more you can get. So you can start with industrial operations data, which is present with a lot of facilities. You have your control systems, BMS systems, and so on. You can also look at company operations, supply chain data, which again is very relevant for today, because there's a lot of software systems out there that are facilitating this in this day and age. And they're smart, they're digital, they contain a, you know, a cornucopia of data that's very, very beneficial. And then finally, company operations data. So at the end of the day, the resource, the human resource in your company itself adds a load to your emissions, and we're able to help you with that as well. How do we do it? Well, we take all this data. We have over 104 different integrations built into our platform. And using these drivers, we're able to aggregate this in real time. And using this data, we're able to pump out not just your basic overall emissions and disclosure reports, but we go well beyond that into looking at emissions breakdown by source, by region, by business unit, and so on and so forth, as well as providing you with carbon reduction strategies and a sustainability roadmap on how we can help you get to net zero. So I'll just jump into a little bit of detail about my product, but I'll keep it quick. So as I said, because we're able to get data in real time, we're able to provide real time insights, benchmarks, comparisons, breakdowns, so on and so forth. And we're able to do this and show you by the locations and every single way you want to slice and dice your data. Beyond that, we're also able to provide flexible options. We understand that not everyone is super digitally mature, right? We've worked with vessel leasing companies where they have a logbook where they keep their data. On the other hand, we've worked with offshore renewable companies who have everything digital. So we're providing that flexibility for people to start where they are, and then as their digital capabilities mature, we're also adapting with the platform itself. So Manual entry is one of the ways, so if they're currently putting into a spreadsheet, just skip that step, put it into our platform. We make it auditable, we make it verifiable, and we make it digital. If not, if you already have a spreadsheet, like as Stephanie said, if you have 15 spreadsheets, put it all in, we automatically classify and sort them so that you don't have to sit there sifting through it, assigning it to a scope, to an emission factor, and finding out where to go and what to do with it. And finally, the uh, the best way to do this is through integrations. So as I said, we've built integrations for the industrial side of things as well as the uh, I, corporate IT side of things. So essentially, anything that has an API, we can read from it. Anything that consumes APIs, you know, we can deliver to it. And again, Sean raised a really good point. The last thing a lot of customers want is another software to it. So we can actually go completely headless. So we can account, do all your ESG management, and dump it right back into your ERP systems or business intelligence platforms as well. And then in addition to this, we help with ESG reporting across formats. So we are using, I know this is a buzzword right now, but generative AI to help you to aggregate all of your ESG data along with your social and governance metrics to come up with an ESG report that adheres with the different frameworks that you're following. So the most popular one in Singapore we see right now is GRI and TCFD. So we're doing that for a lot of companies. In addition to that, uh, we're also able to do uh, quantitative reports break, broken down by every single detail that you need uh, for CDP, which at the moment is one of the most uh, comprehensive ones that we cover. And beyond that, we're also compliant and accurate. So all of our calculations are ISO 14064-1 certified, and we're also working on the decarbonization side for dash two and dash three. So when customers use our platform from day one, they're already compliant, and the audit process becomes a lot more cheaper and a lot, more, a lot faster as well for them. And uh, as I said, this leads to the audit portal. So we've worked with Tufsuit to establish the, the platform in such a way that any auditor can come in and see every single log that has happened within the platform. And uh, finally, we, we also enable collaboration. We understand that ESG is not a single department uh, task. So we allow the, you, as a customer, to connect to different platforms, different vendors as well, and onboard your entire supply chain to the platform if you need to, so that they can enter the data or integrate their data into it. And you can even tag your supervisors to put in data for your ESG reports. Finally, this is the, uh, the more fun part, I guess, from our side. But essentially what we do is we, are, we started out as an AI company looking at purely industrial emissions, but we then you know, focus on sustainability. But we still maintain our core where we are using neural networks in order to model different facilities to look at their scope one and two and to then predict and forecast their emissions into the future to see when they hit net zero. So we do a lot of target setting, materiality assessments, boundary setting, and all that. And using this, we're also able to provide optimizations. So we've uh, done a few projects where we've optimized the fuel consumption, we've optimized logistics schedules, we've optimized warehousing as well, so that's a bit more relevant here. And then on the more energy side, we've optimized the boiler operations, turbine operations, and, and so on and so forth. So 
how does this help our companies? At the end of the day, I mean, most companies look at the dollars and cents. So in our projects so far with most larger companies, we lower the cost by about 75% on average associated with carbon accounting and reporting. We essentially lower the amount of consulting or professional services required to maybe a, a one-month engagement from something that would usually last six to nine months. And finally, this is a bit of our business traction. So we work quite extensively in the, in the industrial complex. So we work with oil and gas companies who have a huge supply chain, as well as a lot of vessel leasing and vessel uh, offshore renewables and so on. And in terms of partnerships, we partner with several consulting firms, consulting firms and tech partners to make sure that we're providing a very comprehensive solution. Because at the end of the day, what we're aiming to deliver is an operating system for ESG, not just the platform. With that, our leadership team has quite a lot of extensive experience working in the ESG field across different regions. So me and my three co-founders, we started out in sustainability about eight years ago, looking at uh, scope one emissions for the US EPA. And since then, we've moved into looking at end-to-end -end carbon accounting and ESG management. And finally, our expertise goes beyond technology. So as I said, we're not just a tool out there. We're building a lot of experience across different industries. So our sustainability team alone has experience in over 55, in 55 different client sectors, and we've dealt with pretty much any uh, framework or reporting standard that you need out there. So with that being said, uh, I'm inviting everyone to kickstart your journey to zero and beyond. Oh, sorry, wrong deck. So these are a few of the case studies that we have for some of the industries that we work with. So thank you for your time. My name is Harry. We will after today. <laughs> Any other questions? How do you uh, compare yourself with other carbon accounting, like unraveled carbon? Yeah, Are no, that's the a same zone of what you do, or is it different? I think essentially at the, at the fundamental level, we do carbon accounting as well. So to compare ourselves to some of the providers like Persephone and Ravel Carbon, uh, they, they do carbon accounting as well, and that's where we start off. The main difference is we don't want to stop at reporting or accounting. So our main value proposition is what we do after that. So the analytics, the insights, and the decarbonization that comes with it. So I would say um, if someone like Unravel comes in and does the accounting, we can still use that data, but we can do that and more as well. Yeah. Maybe just one quick question. Um, I see that you have got this, uh, your team, and where are they based? I mean, do they, they have to do some customization when you onboard you know, different type of customers from different sectors as well, right? Uh, not necessarily. So as a SaaS company, we try to keep the customization to minimal and make configuration the highlight. So our platform is flexible enough that we can uh, operate across most industries. So most of our team is based out of Singapore, or uh, Singapore Malaysia, and the US. Uh, but at the same time, we do provide some SI services in, with our partners or consulting firms if they do need to tweak things or have a lot of configuration to be done. Uh, deliveries in terms of, sorry, just want to make sure. Uh, multimodal, so in other words, yeah, it goes from, yeah, uh, truck. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Truck, delivery. Yeah, so uh, there's a couple ways we address this, right? So we, if you have that data, if your supply chain data is that granular, we can actually automate that process. So if you have, let's say, the information in the waybills or in the procurement, in the PO, where it's coming from and where it's going, then that makes it a lot easier. But failing that, usually we do an initial assessment. So if a customer doesn't have that data, we try to get the average for each one time. And then we put it into the platform as, a, as like a custom uh, emission factor. But we still ensure that we use all the audited emission factors so it still remains verifiable. I hope that answered it. Me. Yeah. Uh, what's your uh, scaling or growth model? How do you intend to scale it beyond Singapore and across the region, India, Europe, US? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's, that's a f obviously at top of our mind for now. So we are already we already have clients in Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, the Middle East. So we operate through a few models. For bigger clients, we go through a, a partnerships or, or joint ventures or resellers, because uh, it does help to have a local presence. But for the most part, as a SaaS service, we also have a, a, a self-onboarding portal for the smaller companies that want to use us. So that's two ways we're going about this. Yeah. 
Uh, a question about uh, operational data versus simulated data. Uh, how much of it are you ingesting direct from like sensors and things like that, and how much of it do companies normally simulate? Yeah, no, uh, that actually depends. It varies quite a lot from what we've seen. So when we work with companies in the energy sector uh, or companies in the real estate sector, they do have more, more smart metering, IoT sensors and all that. So we see about 70, 80% of the scope one emissions and scope two emissions coming from sensors. But unfortunately, I mean, when we go to the maritime sector where uh, you know, some of the vessels are a little bit older, we do have to still rely on spreadsheets or things like that. Yeah. Thank you. We got one question. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's a that's a interesting one. So for us, uh, as as a car ESG management company, we see ourselves as a strategic piece for a lot of other players. If you look at the major consulting firms, McKinsey, Deloitte, PwC, they're all tending towards onboarding solutions and acquiring them. So that's one possible exit strategy. On the other side, because we do have a focus on the industrial side, we do you know, partner with some of the more industrial sensors, technology, and uh, control system companies. So that's another exit strategy. Yeah. Don't want to IPO in this climate. So, yeah. One more question. Yep. Uh, you probably saw the ESG company. Most of this is S. How does the E and the G come in? Sorry, most of this is E. Oh, sorry, most of this yeah. is E, sorry. Yeah. yeah. How does the S and the G come in? Yeah, so that's, again, a great question. So S and G is more... I would say directed towards the corporate side of things, which is why I didn't highlight it today. But essentially, we do a very similar process where when, whenever possible to quantify things, we integrate with HR systems like Workday and so on to get the, those metrics. Beyond that, we also provide uh, these information entry portals. So one example is, let's say, palm oil, right? They're small holders. We have to in ensure they're, they're following social practices. They're not, there's no forced label, labor and so on. So we provide... <clears throat> sorry a questionnaire or form where the data entry can come in directly from whoever's doing the audit. So that get, all gets aggregated automatically into the ESG report at the end of the day. Yeah. And do you integrate with some of the, the, the you know, there, there are sourcing portals that, that do validate that sort of data? Is that something that you, you have integration with or you have plans to do? Yeah, so we integrate with two of them right now. They're both startups. But uh, I mean, as I said, so long as it has an API, we can always make that happen very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I got one question for yourself. So in Singapore, there's about over five over thousand uh, 3PL companies. About four thousand are all small and medium companies. Mostly are small 3PL companies. Um, we are all under pressure to deliver, you know, sustainability and uh, carbon uh, reporting. Oh, sorry, ca carbon emission uh, reports to, uh, to our clients. Um, how can your technology help these uh, small companies, about four thousand of us, in the Singapore landscape? Yeah, um, I think again, very good question because there's a lot of pressure on the smaller guys. Uh, from the bigger companies pushing it down. So we've helped a few SMEs in, in a few ways. To get started is, I think, the, the hardest part. So we come in and we have some advisory services that we provide as part of the subscription to help them to align on where their boundaries lie, where, they're, uh, where they should be looking at, what frameworks to follow. And following that, we provide the, the platform to help track that. So that's one way. In addition to that, we also partner with Enterprise Singapore. We partner with a few of the government agencies to provide grants for this. So we can actually onboard some of the SMEs uh, to 70% subsidy for the first year, including verification, including the advisory services, to ease the pain of getting started. That's great. That's good, good to hear. Thanks. Any more final questions? Yes, we do. How many people have already disclosed to you that you take from there? Yeah, so there's a couple things we do. So our benchmarking um, uh, algorithm actually uses data from CDP as well, in addition to other disclosure, disclosures. Um, we are considering becoming a CDP certified partner, but um, you know we're in two minds about that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Can I begin? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for the um, recommendation on how a company can embark on this teaching. Yeah. So is it like after you have the report and everything, like it will be um, automation to where it will generate the recommendation based on the data, or you will provide an like, exclusive uh, consult consulting service with the company based on their specific like industry and their operations to provide the ESG recommendations? 
That's a good question. So we have two, I would say we have two different approaches. The first one is as soon as a company starts, it's always helpful to have some recommendations on what they can do immediately. So based on your industry, based on the type of assets you've entered into the platform, we provide some out of the box recommendations. So essentially a best practice or a checklist. But as you said, once we collect a critical amount of data, it doesn't have to be after a report. It can be after two to three months of that. We have an uh, AI recommendation system that takes in this data and then produces tailored recommendations. And on top of that, we also provide advisory if you need to figure out how this fits into your operational model and how you can implement it as well. Uh, all right. Uh, in the interest of time, I need one last final question. So uh, based on my understanding, your data collection is based on macro level, and the output is based on predictive analytics, or how you are doing it? Uh, based on data analytics? Is it, is it? Yeah, predictive analytics, or oh. you are using like macro data, right? Yeah. Uh, and the output is based on predictive analytics, or you still you are using micro uh, data? Yeah, so we actually do both. So in the cases where we can collect down to that granular level, we can use data down to like the individual flow meter, all that level. And, and for the areas where it's, it doesn't exist, we do predictive analytics. So we do predictive um, modeling of the assets to then look at what the emissions will be. OK, thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, you talk of uh, uh, recommending solutions. Uh, we think generic uh, solution recommendations, like, for example, we need to do energy transition from fossil fuel to something like you know, about our biofuels. Or, do you have a marketplace in that that will be fine if you're in Singapore, then this is your potential solution provider in Singapore. Yeah, um, it's like you're reading my mind. Uh, so we have we have a couple of ways we do this. So we do have a portfolio of solutions, mostly startups and you know innovative companies that we partner with, that we present as a as a possible decarbonization method. But for larger companies, we do also provide optimization, and then we help them find a vendor as well, or our consulting partners help them find a vendor as well. So we do both ways. Hari, thank you very much. Outstanding thank you. presentation. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you, Steph. Stephanie, sorry. Thank you. And thank you to the presenters here. That was uh, quite, it was quite a lot of energy to finish the, the Logisim this, this year. Uh, so I think the showcase works really well. It was great to see some young startups coming up here and, and giving their ideas. So I hope you all appreciated that. So that concludes pretty much everything. It's been an amazing event since we started yesterday morning. I hope we've met your expectations as an audience, as participants, on driving sustainability and supply chain performance through digitalization. If not, we will try to improve next time. But uh, I think we have through our, our keynote speakers, uh, Mr. Law from Enterprise Singapore uh, yesterday, Wolfgang with his presentations yesterday and today on, on decarbonization especially, uh, Betul from ADECO providing some, some human touch uh, our four tracks, uh, thank you to the track leads uh, who, who presented or provided some, some really good presentations and panellists across the two days through intra-logistics, uh, cold chain, freight and digitalisation. I think they uh, resonated really well with our audience. And lastly, the showcase on Skunk Works here was, uh, I think, a, a quite a good success. So again, really appreciate the input and effort there. Uh, I'd like to thank Singapore Expo as well, uh, CMAT for coming on board, I think uh, Raymond will touch on this. Uh, also to the sponsors, uh, DP World, uh, CPKC, I hope you remember what that stands for, uh, E2I, Pando, Semcorp, uh, Six Sensors, TeamViewer, Inmark and Cognex. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the speakers and panellists that have participated over the last two days. Without your uh, involvement and input and efforts and, and preparation, uh, we will not be able to provide such content to our participants. And last but not least, the participants themselves, thank you very, very much for an engaging couple of days, questions, discussions, 
some negotiations, uh, and I hope that continues well after the event. So on behalf of Bob Gill, who unfortunately couldn't MC the event, it's been my honour to present an MC uh, for you uh, over the last two days. On behalf of the organising committee, who have worked very, very hard in the last few months to get everything up and running, thank you so much for your efforts and work. And without taking any more of uh, Dr Raymond Krishnan's thunder, I think I might have done most of his closing for him. <laughs> I'll hand over now to him uh, for, for the organising chair's closing remarks. Thank you very much and have a great, great year.